rationing debates? Why are we allowing those politicians and their television networks to restrict our debates? And I don't mean parallel interviews, I mean real debates. We don't restrict weather reports, we don't restrict sports, we don't restrict entertainment. We have to become far more intolerant of the suppression of the use of the First Amendment, a free speech, petition, and assembly, which means running for elective office and turning out the votes. Now you say to yourself, I'm sure you've had trouble with these hardline Democrats and Republicans saying, what are you doing thinking about voting for third party and independent candidates? And you know, there's a thinly veiled political bigotry there. They use words like spoiler. Spoiler? Who has spoiled America? Who has spoiled its elections, its government, its hopes, and its future more than the Republican and Democratic parties and their corporate masters? When they, when they try to reduce third parties, independent candidates to second class citizenship, they try to marginalize them. You can properly accuse them of political bigotry political bigotry. They're all for civil rights and civil liberties, except, except for a competitive election. And use those words and watch their reaction. It's so ridiculous, isn't it not? The 60th seat in Wimbledon is given a chance to win the whole thing. The 60th seat in the NCAA is given a chance to win the whole thing. But the third candidacy in the presidential campaign, Nader Gonzalez, is not given a chance to win the whole thing. Because, because the two parties have the key to the debates, which is the opening to reach tens of millions of Americans. There's no other way unless you're a multi-billionaire. Like Ross Perot. No other way to reach tens of millions of Americans. That's not the way we should have a country and a political system. That's the way it is for this year. We've got to change it. A lot of people confuse personal freedom with civic freedom. You know, we have a lot of personal freedom in this country. We can marry who we want, eat what we want, buy what we want, choose our friends, whoever we want, pursue our own habits, uh, walk when we want. We can take a 4,000 pound vehicle three blocks away to buy chiclets if we want. Uh, we have a lot of personal freedom. But you know, don't confuse personal freedom with civic freedom. Civic freedom, we do not have much at all. We have virtually no civic freedom defined by Marcus Cicero as participation in power. That's the only real definition of freedom, participation in power. Do we have participation in our military policy, our foreign policy, our economic policy, our labor policy, our environmental policy? Very little. And I think we become much more upset with our state. And we become much more willing to raise our expectation levels without which we can never motivate ourselves and galvanate ourselves. Our expectation levels to demand more from our political system, from our Congress, our president, our courts, right down to the local community. If we do not demand more, if we lower our expectation levels, the politicians will surely oblige us. And that's why we got to make that distinction between personal freedom and civic freedom. But there's an, another distinction we must make, and that is this. We have aw awfully great assets to turn this country around. You and I know we have all kinds of solutions on the shelf and often in pilot projects around the country for energy, solar energy, energy efficiency. We have uh, solutions for affordable energy. We have solutions to turn these uh, public schools around and make them comparatively responsive to the great idealism and excitement of seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds with their thirst for learning by getting rid of leave no child behind, for starters, which does leave no ch does leave child behind. <clears throat> it's about expectation levels. And that means we have to make demands on ourselves. And I want to leave you with 
an ancient Chinese proverb. You know, when I was in school, I studied Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Ch uh, Spanish, and it was really quite interesting to see how they would try to get you to learn the languages through pro proverbs. This one is from the Ming Dynasty in the 14th century. And once you hear it, you really will never forget it because it sears right to your soul. It sears to the situation we're in now. So many solutions, so many good people who know how to do good things for our country, shut out or demoralized. And here it is. To know and not to do is not to know. To know and not to do is not to know. You know. You wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't know. You know of the injustices, and you know of, of what we can do with these injustices and these deprivations and these detonations of human possibility. To know and not to do is not to know. And I want to leave you with a reflection on Jimmy Carter. Bill Clinton, who supported the cruel economic sanctions against the people of Iraq in the 1990s, which didn't disadvantage Saddam Hussein one bit. He had his mansions, and he had his food, and he had everything he wanted, medicine. Took the lives of an estimated 500,000 Iraqi children by the estimate of a distinguished panel of physicians in this country who would go over Iraq and survey the scene. He gets prime billing at the Democratic National Convention. Jimmy Carter, who is clearly our greatest ex-president ever, and who is, and I say this, I say this even knowing he opposed our candidacy in 2000, in 2004, and will in 2008, but his, his advances of health care in Africa and elsewhere, his peacemaking around the world, his work to get rid of serious infectious diseases, and his heroic book after, and his heroic book after, after being the only president who brought peace between Israel and Egypt, his heroic book, which showed the way for a two-state solution, supported by a majority of Palestinians and Israelis and Jewish Americans and Arab Americans, to resolve that conflict that is radiating and festering through a huge portion of the world that's turned against us. He is given a belated, subordinated role at the Democratic National Convention. I guess that's their definition of political heroism. My friends, on January 21st, George Bush and Dick Cheney will become fugitives from justice. The full, the full application of the federal criminal laws are applicable to them. They are not immune. Fugitives from justice without sheriffs pursuing them or district attorneys will establish a horrendously monarchical precedent for future presidents who think that they may get away with the same criminal and unconstitutional behavior day after day, week after week. 